everybody and welcome or welcome back to an invisible and invisible illness awareness project. This week I'm going to do something very different. I recently was notified that Emerge Australia was having an international research symposium on ME. Um, and I wasn't really sure how I was going to do this at first, but in the end I decided that the best thing is gonna be to just let you guys watch it for yourselves. Sometimes I might have a video that's under 10 minutes and sometimes over 20 minutes, but I try to keep them between 10 and 20 minutes. But with this here, I decided that it just makes a lot more sense to let you guys actually watch the speech for yourselves. So I put the whole thing in here. He was talking for about 40 minutes, so I'm gonna try to make my bit as quick as possible because this is gonna be a really long video. But for those of you who maybe just don't have the capacity to watch the whole thing, or you maybe don't really wanna waste your time and energy on something that you're not sure is gonna be what you're looking for, I thought I would still go ahead and tell you what really jumped out at me the most. So you can hear my sort of highlight reel and decide if you'd like to continue on and watch the rest of it. So the first speaker was Dr. Mark Donahoe of Mosman Integrative Medicine in Sydney. Um, he's gonna be the only one in this video because his speech lasted for about 40 minutes. I haven't watched the other speakers yet, but when I get to them, chances are I'll like what they say too and be posting those in the next few weeks. But for the first speaker, here are the things he said that had me just like, wow, yes, thank you. So, he said, each individual has their own path to ME and their own path out of it, which is why research studies don't provide statistical outcomes. You get patients who have different sort of variants of ME and then they don't respond the same way. Um, it's not caused by one agent or pathology. It's a stable state of ill health affecting multiple organ systems, but patients usually don't acquire serious diseases like cancer, diabetes, or heart disease, even when they fit the criteria and you would expect them to have those diseases and it's surprising that they don't. So no one specialist really feels responsible for them. Many patients have multiple genetic SNP mutations in common that predispose them to ME and the pressure on the snips is like a trap is like weight on a trap door and eventually it just snaps which i really like that metaphor which kind of explains why you feel like everything's fine and then all of a sudden the next day you've fallen through this trap door and there's no going back it's as real as any other illness and just because it's unsolvable does not give doctors permission to allocate you to the garbage bin of medicine called psychiatry. When we get good at medicine, psychiatry will recede. That kind of reminds me of the whole theory of miracles where people say that everything was attributed to miracles before we really had science and as science was able to explain things the explanation of mysterious things as a miracle kind of dwindled down. Most do not respond well to any given medication. Two patients could appear identical, but one will be helped by a certain treatment, and the other will have an adverse reaction that takes months to recover from. Meaning, every patient needs an individualized plan. Um, then he had this anchor metaphor, which is also really great which is basically that you have all of these anchors anchoring the ship and you can raise several of the anchors but the ship is still not going to move until you lift that last anchor. So people will try different therapies like vitamin C infusions or going gluten free and nothing will happen so they'll be like okay that's not helping go back to eating gluten and stopping the infusions but really what you need to do is that and then continue on to find your last anchor and then all of those in combination will be what uh, will be what improves your situation. The worst outcome is suicide when you have no hope and no way out. If you provide medical support, community, research, disability, you can at least give patients a better quality of life. Um, 
This is something that I've heard mentioned in other seminars where the doctors do recognize that suicide is a very big risk. Like he said, when you have no hope and no way out, there's no cure, but symptom treatment can improve quality of life and allow you to participate in things that are valuable to you. Um, you can improve to the point where you can function within certain limits while paying high attention to those limits, but usually you acquire sort of a new normal where those limits are maybe more than you were able to do when you initially got sick or when you were at your worst, but they're still not allowing you to function at the level that you were before you got sick. It's definitely something that I've experienced in my own life. You can validate with friends, family, school, community to head off isolation. Support is vital to any chance of recovery. I'm just wow that he emphasized how important it is to have a support system because that's I would say one of the biggest things that's lacking like I think that's been one of the hardest things to deal with that I never would have imagined being a part of this you have to be visible before you can be funded then you have to find the right questions to ask before you can find the answers uh, ME is three times as prevalent in women as men, which fits with the autoimmune stats. It's likely a hibernation response, which means the body shuts down all non-essential functions. That's also something that crossed my mind. I was kind of thinking my body was sort of constantly fighting my whole life where I was always getting colds, uh, having more run-ins with allergens than I should have. And I felt like my body was just exhausted from constantly fighting and went into hibernation mode. You know, I didn't use that exact word, but it was kind of like I just shut down. And I had no energy to keep fighting, so I just kind of shut off to, you know, to stay alive, like it was, you know, survival mode. Um... It is not a rich white person's disease. It's that minorities have no access to medical care. Also blown away that he not only recognized that, but actually brought attention to it. Um, let's see. Um, he mentions that he wouldn't know if his dog had ME, but I recently saw a thread where someone was asking if animals have ME, and several people said that they um, that they knew about ME in horses. So pathology can show abnormalities, but many doctors write them off. Also an experience I've had where I'll be looking through my labs and they have my values and then they have the normal range and I'll be like, all of these are too low. And I had a doctor say, well, we don't care about those. It only matters if it's too high. And then there will be things that are too high, but they're not being addressed. And they're kind of like, oh, no, that couldn't be it. And that could have something to do with it. Treatment guidelines ignore holistic approaches like diet, probiotics, exercise, water, meditation. Also huge to hear this coming from an MD, since a lot of them really can't say anything to holistic approaches. I told a doctor years ago that I was taking a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar twice a day for my asthma and I didn't need to use my inhaler and she's like well I can't really say anything to that because I haven't been educated on that and that's a big part of the problem is that not only are doctors not being educated on illnesses like ME they are not educated on holistic approaches to treating these illnesses which are a very integral part of how your body functions and can't be overlooked if you want to actually see an improvement. Hypersensitivity to medication and the need for microdosing, um, where he recognized he has a patient, you can't just give them a normal dose because even the smallest dosage might be too much for someone with ME. And he says managing symptoms of adrenal responses by taking amphetamines or stimulants is probably not smart. I'm glad he said this because that is one of those things that has been going through my mind for a while now where I'm kind of like, what if I took like Ritalin or something like that to boost my energy? But I have talked to other patients and from what he's saying, 
I know that that's something you really want to be careful with because if your body's telling you to stop and you find a way to circumvent that, then you're probably going to end up short-circuiting or something. So, yeah. Without further ado, you can now hear the entire speech in his own words, if you like. And I will see you guys next week. Research is done with statistical methods, with large groups of people, and I think in CFS, that's one of the major failings, that we've tried to group everybody under a heading that doesn't fit everybody. Each individual is a challenge to medicine because each individual has their own individual path to CFS. They have their own individual path out of it. And when you put that into a statistical group, you never get statistical outcomes that are able to direct us. I was one of those doctors who called ineffective doctors homeopathic. I was one of those doctors who berated anybody who would consider moving outside modern medicine. So I have a kind of penance to do in the Catholic tradition. There is a burnout among doctors. Doctors feel that we should solve problems, that we should make people better. And when people don't get better, the risk is the doctor thinks there's something wrong with the patient that's not being said. It's all psychological. They categorise or recategorise. And it's that that I think is damaging. It's become very damaging. Just recently I had a haematologist send a letter back to Comcare saying, this is crazy, there is no cause for this illness because it's all in the head. Now that concept of all in the head would probably startle ENT surgeons who, yes, it's all in the head. However, it is as real as any other illness and just because it's unsolvable does not give my provision the chance to allocate you to the garbage bin of what I regard as the garbage bin of medicine. We call it psychiatry. It has a Bible called DSM-5. <laughs> and at that point, you are in trouble. You're in serious trouble because once people start to think like psychiatrists, we can manipulate your brain so you don't complain, they are right. Enough Valium, you don't complain. Enough anything that affects the brain, you don't complain. As Heidi said, I tend to veer away from drugs why? Because the bad experience I've had with so many of those drugs over so long a period of time. I keep getting enthused about new studies. Why don't you just use X? Quetiapine, that's going to quick, uh, fix it. The reason I don't use it is that most of the people I see do not respond well to any given medication. There is nothing. I can get three in a row do well, the next person looks exactly the same, and there's a terrible adverse reaction that sets them back for months. So I have that predisposition to go softly, and therefore, by general standards in the CFS community, I'm an under-treater. And in part, I've come to that because of a conclusion that I see CFS ME not as a disease caused by one agent or pathology. Medicine's great at that. If you have pneumonia, and we know the mycoplasma, we know the antibiotic, we know you'll be better in 96 hours, and we're really good at that job. But where there's multiple agents over multiple long, long time periods accumulating one after another, multiple organ systems, the trouble is you don't belong to any specialist. They all think they know the answer and then they discard you. So I have this concept that it's an adaptive response, and we'll go into this, the closest hill or not. When the rain starts coming and the floods rise, the body goes for the closest hill, not the highest hill. And if the floodwaters keep rising, you get stranded on that hill and then you're in serious trouble. Other people have a bit more resilience, they make it to the highest hill, the floodwaters don't bother them and they don't see it. So that and a boat with many anchors, one at a time. I talk with this by a naturopath. This is an illness where there can be a dozen anchors out there and you pull up one, nothing happens. Pull up one, nothing happens. Pull up one, nothing happens. The last thing that you do that makes a difference, the person writes a book about. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if it's ice water or it doesn't matter if it's visiting the Himalayas, it doesn't matter what it is. The last item is very impressive. The last anchor lifted allows you to move. But until that time, all the other work was necessary. And I say that from experience, that I learned about intravenous vitamin C from Ian Brighthope many uh, years ago, around about 1987. I had lots of these patients who had done allergy work, nutrition, we'd done everything that we could think of, and we started intravenous vitamin C, and 20 people in a row got magically better. I thought, wow, this is the cure. Why did no one tell me about this before? The trouble is, I then did that as the first thing for everyone that came in, and it had no great effect. So what did occur to me then is, I had a lot of people who really needed that last push that I'd accumulated, that didn't get better. The last push made the difference, and I was impressed by it as a doctor. But now it's just a part of the toolbox. And I come back to that in a while, 
that you don't throw an anchor back just because you didn't move. So the critical thing about the many anchors is you do a good job on something and people say, well, I went off gluten, but I'm still not better. Okay, go back on gluten. That's not sensible. There are times where you need to proceed along in principle to say, let's lift the anchors one at a time, and boy, that can wear people out. So CFS may be a stable state of ill health, but it may be the least worst way the body can manage. And I say this for one reason only. The people who I see who are damaged, disabled, in bed, you would say they're the sickest people around in medicine. They stay at that level of sickness. They don't get the cancers and the diabetes and the heart disease that you would expect them to get. And I say with 35 years experience, I've had six patients with cancer. In 35 years, no doctor that I know has had only six patients with cancer. I have people whose obesity, whose weight, whose difficulties are high, they should be diabetic, and they're not. And that's one of the problems, that if this is an adaptive response which is designed by the body to be the least worst outcome possible, then you don't get the worst outcome, whereupon a specialist owns you and you're on drugs and you are going to get treated. You end up in this stable state where everyone goes, well, they're not really endocrine, they're not really cardiac, they're not really anything, and you don't then have a name or a place to go in medicine for that illness. The evidence for this view, CFS ME is a stable state of ill health with exacerbations and remissions that don't progress or recover. They have an up and down life. The worst outcomes, and I say this for now eight of my patients, has been suicide. So it is a potentially fatal disease when you have no hope and no way out. Over those years, those eight patients, uh, shall I say, play on my mind quite a bit. There's evidence for multiple genetic SNPs. So when we look at metabolomics and genetics, there's multiple SNPs. And I keep thinking when I see these people, what's the odds of having all of those lined up? And the obvious answer is you wouldn't be in my surgery if they hadn't lined up. If you only had one of those SNPs, it's easy to manage. SNPs are single nucleotide polymorphisms. But those genetic variants that are, you know, allow us to vary our biology can also line up in odd ways that are not compatible with the world that we live in today. There are many simultaneous uh, predispositions. So those SNPs, the methylation SNP, the, say the Lewis non secretor SNP, you have one after another. They're lined up like trapdoors ready to go at some point, and when the stress upon them is at its highest, that trapdoor snaps, and it's a one-way trip. And I think we had Neil talk about this earlier, that that one-way trip is when you fall through that, it's not like you're rolling down the hill. You have fallen off the cliff at that point, and you didn't even know the cliff was there. And conventional diagnostic and therapeutic medicine just on the whole doesn't work. It's rubbish, and it makes a lot of us worse. I say us, but I had a CFS-like illness for 18 months back in 95, and then it magically just got itself better. And I thought, God, that's a lesson. You know, it comes from somewhere I'm looking over my shoulder. But for a year and a half there, I was highly sensitive and unable to work, and I could not understand the reasons why. And all the conventional approaches didn't work. The final thing is I lost my insurance because I was told that if I just went on amphetamines for the rest of my life, I'd be fine. I'm pleased I didn't take that advice. So consider as we talk today, the US Department of Veterans Affairs have been addressing Gulf War syndrome, developed a concept of chronic multi-system illness in which they advise not to go down the medical path with drugs and surgical and other interventions. This group of people that they tried all of that on, um, that Nicholson was addressing as well, they've developed this concept of a management being simple, straightforward, unloading the person, and there, it is a really worthwhile thing to assess. It's been a lot of work, and the reason I raise it is Graham Edwards of the College of Physicians here in Australia is taking the college down that path of looking at not dismissing these illnesses as untreatable or unmanageable, but taking it as it's multi-system, doesn't belong to a specialty, and if you take it gently and you approach it in the right way and you provide support and research money and support in the community and disability support, if you do all of those things, you can work with people to become better, but you cannot make them better. I'm presenting something that I went to Queensland, listened to, very impressed by Daniel Peterson on the treatment. And I know everybody is keen for, what's the treatment, what's the treatment? I haven't got any magic for you, but I'm going to present what he said, and it is very promising. We need to build 
um, a MECFS evidence base, and if the NHMRC won't fund it, then we have to do it ourselves. And that's what I applaud Emerge and others for doing, that you have to be visible before you can be funded. Then you have to go and find out what questions to ask, and then you have to answer them. And that building of uh, evidence by consensus of experts, which is starting in America, I think has got a good starting point. I'm going to overdue, overview the recommendations and the practical applications. There are many of the things the Americans use that no Australians can get hold of. The Th Therapeutic Goods Administration and Border Control keep many of those drugs out of our hands. Um, the TGA and HNMRC and this last two weeks the Medical Board of Australia have stepped in. The Medical Board of Australia may make this entire conference relatively moot because the new regulations they propose say that only conventional medicine can be done and effectively compounding prescribing most of the treatments that most CFS doctors use will not be able to be done. You will risk deregistration by using anything outside the conventional mainstream. And it's something I will talk to you at the end about putting the public submissions in and saying, no, that's not acceptable. Any slide you see in yellow is Daniel Peterson's. He gave this talk 26th, 27th of November for Griffith University. I think I'll just slip over these two slides. The claims about the American numbers, everything's dodgy. When you come to numbers in chronic fatigue syndrome, where's the dividing line? What is this illness? Is it 1%, 2%? Is it that 20% of the population feel it at some time and then some recover and some don't? We don't actually know about it. And at least one of the best questions to answer would be just where is it, how is it, and who is it? And we keep on trying to cure something that we don't have a clue about. The quarter, one quarter of CFS ME patients are bed bound or house bound. That's certainly true in my practice, but my practice is now mainly referral from other doctors and uh, some other health practitioners. Three times as many women as men should give us a thought. What else is three times as many in women as men? Autoimmune disease is a very good example. If we have thoughts that the immune system is hyper-responsive, then we have to think that would play out with women having about four times more. Of course, the medical profession says, oh, also hysteria, the migration of the womb to different areas of the body is also many times more common in women than in men. So you can never kill psychiatry. It will, it will always come up with an alternative answer. When we get good at medicine, psychiatry will recede, I'm sure. Um, most are Caucasian, but that's because we don't care about people who aren't Caucasian. So it's not that it's a rich white person's disease, it's that many people of colour many other groups have no access to medical care, so they're invisibly invisibler if there's such, an, if there's such a thing in CFS. So if you only count the whites, of course it's only whites. Uh, average onset, 33, I would think that's probably about right. I do see a whole subset <laughs> of kids. In, the, in New South Wales, it's called the Higher School Certificate and Glandular Fever uh, Syndrome. But there is a group of kids around the 16 to 18 to 20 range who do go down, and then there seems to be a lull through the 20s, and the next peak, I think, is probably around the 30s. Um, it certainly happens in very, very young kids as well. It costs a lot. Whatever it costs, people who are out there who are creative, capable, who were full human beings, have their lives restricted to such an extent that it now costs us in terms of social input. It costs us in terms of creativity, and then, of course, it costs us in terms of GDP. Now, here's a funny thing. If we were all in hospital with CFS, we'd be improving GDP. No one knows that, knows that, do they? But GDP is escalated by more sick people. There's more doctors doing more jobs in more hospitals. The turnover of that money makes it a very valuable thing. So we could even approach the uh, federal government to say, look, we'll all turn up in hospital and improve GDP if you'll simply put some of that money towards us. There is no cure, but symptom treatment can improve the patient's quality of life. I think that's true. But then when we talk about cure and we, and we talk about quality of life, they're two different things. A lot of my practice is getting people back to the point where they're not like they were, but they are good enough to participate in the things that are valuable to them in their lives. And I see this in chemical sensitivity. I'm asked, does anyone ever fully recover? I've seen one person absolutely fully recover from pesticide-induced chemical sensitivity. Went right back to the job she did three years later. She'd lived out in the country as a hermit, away from everybody, bloody determined, but she made it back to her workplace and was no longer chemically sensitive. All the rest that I see 
improve to the point that they can function within limits and they pay high attention to what those limits are. They're a, they're a kind of budget. They know it ahead of time. In another metaphor, they don't roll to the very edge of the hill. They don't fall off the cliff anymore. So they're normal within their new normal limits, but it's not what they experienced before. I, th I think this is a worthwhile paper that um, Daniel also put up, the Infection Elicited Autoimmunity, ME, CFS, an explanatory model. I think it's a paper worth reading of a cascade of events um, that involve immunity, that involve neurology, that involve many of our specialties. Every specialist wants to be the saviour of this illness. Every one of them gets defeated by the illness. But the very points of that are there are genetic predispositions, there are infectious triggers, there's an immune dysregulation and auto-reactivity, this concept of autoimmunity, and then there's altered metabolic processes. And do we know if those altered metabolic processes are the cause? They're probably not, but we don't go back and do metabolomics on healthy people waiting for them to get it, so we don't know what they were before. So that, that point is those genetic predispositions that you don't know about at birth, you run into infections and you deal with 20 of them in a row, fine, and then the next one is a glandular fever or it's a you know, parasitic infection and everything goes wrong. And suddenly a whole lot of mechanisms flip into place about immune dysregulation and autoimmunity. And we do also have evidence now of what I would call an adaptive hibernation response. That what does that metabolomic look most like? It looks most like a type of hibernation, a primitive hibernation response where the body shuts down a lot of non-essential functions and keeps the heart, the brain that keeps the kidneys going. And the question then is, what's non-essential? Is talking non-essential? Is a brain that can focus on you know, doing work in the afternoon non-essential? Yes. In the extreme, in these pushed cases, the non-essential functions are the very things that we see in chronic fatigue syndrome. And I always use this. I have a dog called Digby. I'd love to show a photo. For Digby, if he got chronic fatigue syndrome, I wouldn't know it because he sleeps all day anyway. And he doesn't have an aspiration to be a better dog or a running dog. He chases <laughs> rabbits. He chases rabbits when they appear in front of him and then he stops. And I can't tell, no one can tell if he has chronic fatigue syndrome. He appears to be a normal dog. But only humans have aspirations. Only we know the life that we were leading and could lead. If Digby fell over tomorrow and couldn't do anything again, he wouldn't remember that there was a life that he used to live that was better. I hope he wouldn't anyway. So let's go on to what Daniel and his crew have recommended there. That there are general medical approaches, a trusting relationship with each patient. That is more critical than you would think. A lot of doctors treat patients as though they are subjects of a, a study, that they are the action upon, you know, the things upon which they act with their brilliant minds. And they don't develop either a, a collaborative arrangement or a trust. And patients, my patients especially, I don't know if this is true for everyone, very sensory sensitive patients have one skill, they can pick up what another person is thinking like that. They know when a specialist puts on the face but doesn't care. They come back and say, don't send me to that idiot again. And uh, was he not nice? No, it's not that he's not nice. He just doesn't care. He doesn't actually care. He, I, there's no trust there. But that trusting relationship, the reason I spend three hours or two hours with people to begin with is not because I need to know every last bit of that information. It's that without hearing the story, I think I know what's wrong before they tell me what's wrong. And I think I know how they're going to get better before they tell me how they're going to get better. In that two or three hours, the critical thing is, in that story is the origins of the illness, the family history of a mum used to get that. Oh, all the women have thyroid disease in my family. The things that doctors have just not paid attention to and always in there, there's a, a, a touch on, you know what, when I did X, that's the best I felt. And if you as the doctor are thinking, no, I know better than you, then you haven't paid attention to that. The review of the past history, meds and results, <clears throat> I've got to say this, one upside of three hours is I get to see the stuff-ups of my own profession, that the answers are there in the past pathology, the hemochromatosis with high ferritin and high iron, the methylation issues with the high homocysteine. They're in the results. People looked at them and said, nah, that's not a disease. You don't pass go. And that's that, you know, I saw an anchor, but I didn't lift that one because that couldn't be the cause. And so at least for half of my patients, reviewing what's already been done 
provides a very good set of answers about the things you would do to lift anchor after anchor. Order testing to exclude untested things. There are another group of patients who are told they're their dear, it's always women, you'll be fine and no one tests anything, not even the basics of thyroid function, anemia, iron deficiency. And so the ordering of the testing is critical to cover the things that have been left out by doctors who gave up mentally before they even did their good medicine. Develop a plan individualised for the patient. I think that is critical that no two patients, I see people that I swear are identical, two kids, same class, glandular fever, high school certificate, nailed it, right? I know what's going on with you and I don't. The two people end up having totally different outcomes from the same treatment. One does well, one does terribly, I've never made them worse in their whole life. So the individualised plan requires that thought of work with each individual sufferer. Validate the disease with the patient's family and others. This is again critical. What happens in CFS? It's a disease of isolation. At its worst, the family starts to doubt that the person is sick and the family withdraws and that isolation, it's like a bee in a colony. Once you're alone, this is not a manageable disease whatsoever or a manageable illness. So bringing in patients, family and others, people who care, school, teachers and others is a critical part of this. The community around that person needs to be supportive for there to be any chance of recovery. I've never seen a person recover isolated from within all of their support structures. And the social needs and assessment need to be there. NDIS is a catastrophe. It is balls up, a catastrophe. I had dinner with a person I went to school with, us old white men, us old white men tend to hang around in professional groups. He's working as a lawyer in the NDIS and said, look, there's 300,000 paid for, there's 1.2 million that we can't afford. The government's doing a trick to take the funding away to make the budget look good this year so it dumps Labor with a $10 billion black hole in two years' time to win the election after that. Oh, wow, that's complicated. And he said, bottom line is, we're not giving anyone any more money. Those people screaming will be the next government's problem. And that cynicism about, hey, we can create a problem for the election we're about to lose for the next group. I said, what, what happens if the uh, coalition wins? He said, that's a catastrophe for them, <laughs> which uh, is an interesting perspective. Okay, so let's go down these lines. The consensus, the level of evidence, we have this quality of evidence rating. Um, the evidence that we're talking about is obtained from expert committee reports or opinions about clinical and or clinical experience of respected authorities and case reports. It's the lowest level of evidence. It should not be. This is a quality of evidence ranking on randomised controlled trials with a whole trillion, two trillion dollar business running the world around. Of course, everyone wants $10 million trials. But in fact, the science is going on at the doctor's desk, at the naturopath's desk, at everywhere but randomised trials. And the randomised trials have been universally a failure because of aggregating people with chronic fatigue syndrome who are not alike. I don't want you to focus on this, but this, when the report comes out, is the method by which they did it. They asked the 12 um, elders with a total of 300, I think he said, 300 years of experience in CFS, and I said, 12 divided. No, I should have been in that group. I'm old enough to be contributing my 33 years. Um, they've done this and just basically taken a poll. What works in your clinical experience? What's dangerous? What's good? And so they developed these graphs. And so if you like, on the left, the bluer and the higher the numbers are, the darker the blue and the higher numbers, the more they would say this is something useful for this thing. So in here, this one we're talking about sleep, the gabapentin, the Lyrica, you can see a tendency towards certain types of drug therapies. It's a method of just charting out so you can visually look at a chart and say, okay, what's next on the list of things that I would do if I'm looking for treatment of sleep in this particular group? So the method is do the poll, graph it up, give a nice little chart like this, and then just run down the list of the things with the best evidence. And it's not a bad idea. I mean, it's good visual presentation, but your concepts still need to be right. Problems. Many of the drugs talked about by Daniel and available in America easily are not TGA approved and or are impossible to get in Australia. The experts like us, the people who think that they're old and white and male and know how to run the world, we're at the end of the line. We're seeing not the people who need the help of the first weeks, months or even years of their illness. We're seeing the ones that everyone else can't cope with on referral 
And so end of the line, you use the stuff that is more radical, more risky, and you end up with a set of recommendations that may not be the best for everybody. They represent last line drugs rather than first line, and many of them can only be used in an institutional setting, things with intravenous applications, which the Americans use almost on the, you know, walking past on the street, you'll get an IV line put in there. That tends to be constrained here in Australia. Entrepreneurial medicine and going out and finding patients and treating them before they see you is not done much here. The treatment's ignored. They largely ignore the simple stuff, the stuff that's difficult to do. Gut management uh, with diet, probiotics, lifestyle approaches, diet, exercise, water, time, yoga, qigong, uh, and modifying the workplace school for the disability suffered by the person. So these are largely ignored in these guidelines. These are treatment guidelines of what pill, at what dose do you use to intervene. There may be a reason for that. That's because these are really sick people at the end of the line, not early. So let's just go through. Consensus on sleep from Daniels, sleep hygiene, OTC, over-the-counter medica medications, and melatonin. Well, obviously, not melatonin here because that's an S4 drug. Magnesium and GABAglycine combinations, low-dose tricyclics, which are amitriptyline, nortriptyline. They're antidepressants when used in the 50 to 150 milligram range, and they have this odd effect on pain and sensory sensitization when you're using them down at the 10 to 20 milligram range. So we're now seeing many of the drugs, they weren't used off-label, it's just at different doses, they have utterly, utterly different effects. Low-dose naltrexone, another one of those. Low-dose naltrexone at uh, around about 4.5 milligrams, very different to naltrexone at 50. And pregabalin, if pain is involved, beta blockers, alpha blockers, and quetiapine. I will tell you a short story. Did any of you see the Insight show last year? Yeah. Yes. I got a lovely email, oh, well, not a lovely email, a lovely feedback form on my website that said, you effing idiot, I'm a psychiatrist, I put people on quetiapine and an SSRI, I have them all better in six weeks, what the F are you doing ripping people off by dealing with this illness as if it's complicated? So I think that should go into the evidence base as well. I'm putting that over to Daniel as, well, here's another rational thought that's come out of a psychiatrist in Australia. <laughs> I have a confirmation bias problem here. I'm thinking, oh, thank God that's what he, he says he's a psychiatrist. Everyone else denies it. My variations are sleep hygiene is useful. It's hard to do for a person whose sleep is fouled up. Probiotics and foods make a big difference. And this, again, comes back to work we did at Newcastle a long while ago. Probiotics were really, really important in setting the sleep cycle. You get the gut right, you have a lot better chance with sleep. Melatonin is a prescription here, but again, can be really useful. The dosage can vary from 0.1 milligram all the way up to around about nine milligrams. It's a tough one because I have harmed people's sleep dreadfully giving the standard two or three milligram dose. Set them off, one person didn't sleep for six days on two milligrams of melatonin and nearly suicided, but at 0.3 of a milligram of melatonin, did very, very well in his sleep. So it's not simple when people have these drug sensitivities. Magnesium and the long-term use of GABA slash glycine, really, really useful in setting the sleep up. And I think also the one that we forget is L-tryptophan. L-tryptophan makes an enormous difference to people, some people, and it does feed into the serotonin cycle. It can be hydroxytryptamine, L-tryptophan, but playing with the body's own natural responses and upping the available amino acids and it, this is in many areas, is probably going to be the future. Low-dose tricyclics does work. Nortriptyline has the least anticholinergic effect, and so probably 10 milligrams of nortriptyline is worth a trial. Now, I'll also own up here, I have a wife who is an absolute perfect subject for variations on sleep, and she keeps on wanting me to prescribe things for her, and so I t stick with L-tryptophan. Whenever I do a prescription drug, it works like magic because she puts it on the side of her bed, says, I'm not going to take that drug, I, and her body gets the message to go back to sleep. So I have a bedside which has got temazepam, it's got nortriptyline, it's got a whole lot of things, never open packages, and it helps us sleep remarkably. <laughs> Manage the pain if present, um, and then the beta blockers, alpha blockers, and quetiapine. Again, I would just say I'm not fond of those ones. Managing the symptoms of adrenal responses is probably not smart. Neurocognitive, reduce the cognitive load, rhodiola, but this again is Daniel's uh, group's suggestions. Antidepressants, the activating ones, um, the brain stem stimulants, uh, drugs to improve sleep, again low dose uh, tricyclics. And then I think the 
the, shall I say, uh, difficult one to sustain here is using Ritalin versus modafinil versus caffeine. It doesn't, in my opinion, work very well, but again, I will own up. I see the people who are highly chemically sensitive and giving people caffeine, uh, modafinil or uh, Ritalin tends to send them off very quickly. And I've learned very quickly that I have not had a single success with any of those three that I keep away. I would say, you know, there may be devices that we can use for neurocognitive. What does that mean? That means there's an iPhone in your pocket that takes some of the memory load off. It doesn't, it's not the same as getting better, but it does mean that you can put the, uh, some of the details into the phone and then not load up the brain. So reducing cognitive load, yes, Digby does that by lying down and sleeping all day. I don't think it's an effective treatment. The rhodiola B vitamins Q10, highly variable responses in my patients. The antidepressants, I almost always leave alone. I, I just hate them because they've got this word antidepressant and we don't even know what depression is. We don't separate endogenous from uh, anything else. So I do go for neuroinflammation, CBD, magnesium, the gut and the vagus nerve. The orthostatic intolerance, these are really, really hard because blood pressure dropping doesn't do much good for you. So the ideas of electrolytes, compression stockings and consistent exercise, exercise is difficult. Uh, the beta blockers, fluid recorders, omidadrine, I would simply put them in this order that the fluid recorder zone, I think, has got capacity to make a difference for the sodium losers with the dropping blood pressure. Uh, Ivabradine is making a big move these days because it can slow the heart without having all the other effects of the beta blockers. And Ivabradine or Coralin is uh, proving more and more useful. And getting the electrolytes, salt and volume loading is great. But I have had patients where we got everything right with POTS. It looked pure POTS. Everything was right. The blood pressure was up. Everything was stabilised on three of these drugs. She came in. I was expecting her to be well. She said, I've never been sicker in my whole life. Which comes back to what am I modifying that her body wanted to do differently? And if I'm taking over that response of a body, I've got to be very careful. Pain, dry needling, osteopathy, cannabinoids. There's, they have non-pharmacological cannabinoids over there, which we lack, <laughs> non-pharmacological. These are bloody expensive in Australia. We can get them, but they cost a bomb and they don't work all that well yet. The intravenous immunoglobulin, low-dose naltrexone, histamine blockers and ketamine. So just my take on that is dry needling, osteopathy, cannabinoids can be useful, but CBD only, not the THC component, obviously. Intravenous immunoglobulin is, contr is controlled in the country and impossible to get and was great for some people with this clear immunological abnormalities. And now I have worked by bum off, as some people here will tell you, to try and get it, and we cannot loosen it up. Low-dose naltrexone and low-dose nal tricyclics are ones that I do use regularly, and there's value, but again, tricky to use. Ketamine is now impossible, and intravenous lignocaine I haven't tried. The immunology, immunovir, IVIG, again, one that we can't get hold of, and the cytokine blockers. I do have at least half a dozen patients who are Montelukast, often at a high dose, modifying the cytokines, get their symptomatic improvement without apparent adverse effects. It's not the commonest thing in the world, and it's at the end of the line of things that I do, but it, it has been very interesting to see that if you think immune activation and an inability to stop that kind of uh, cytokine storm, then the Montelukast can make a difference. Infections, and yeah, this is the list. This is where it gets controversial. Valaciclovir, Femciclovir, Valganciclovir, um, enteroviral treatments, and azithromycin, doxycycline. Again, I am not a fan of antibiotics. The question about why the pathogen remains stable, doesn't kill, doesn't get better, doesn't get worse, is a deeper one. And so I think the immunological management is more important than the infection control. And of course, we have a, you know, a kind of difficulty in Australia with the whole use of the high-dose intravenous and other antibiotics for Lyme-like illness here that uh, that needs a lot more evidence before we can really run down that path of infection control. So I've just put them all in red there. The reason why is every one of them doesn't answer a question of why a person's sick with this particular bug. It just assumes immunological incompetence. The antiviral recommendations I tend to disagree with, but if you have any form of a recurrent herpes illness, 
they should be on long-term prophylaxis, meaning long-term valgansiclovir at valsiclovir. These are the anti-herpes virus drugs. They are moderate to mild at the very best of times. There are occasional apparent cures, but I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't put those in a box of things to always do. And then Epstein-Barr virus, the IgM uh, positivity and early antigen antibodies. I test this routinely. I do see it regularly. And there is one item that uh, Daniel did bring forward, which is the old, uh, an old diuretic that we used to use. And um, its use does stop the replication of the viruses and stops the lymph nodes popping up and allows people to not have the sore throat. That's impressive. It stops viral replication, but it doesn't stop the immune activation. So the reason I'm not mentioning it or giving dosages is it's got a long way to go before it's in our little armamentarium. I'll leave you with this slide as their supplements that they decided in descending order, the methylfolate, methyl B12 for the poor methylators, vitamin B12 generally, CoQ10, NADH, carnitine, omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids, glutathione OV, fairly low on the list. Magnesium, I think reasonably, nearly every doctor who treats CFS says start the magnesium, get them on magnesium. And then the remainder of them down there. To me, the probiotics that they low down on the list there are without which I wouldn't be doing my job. I rely on gut management and I rely on probiotics. Living foods, probably better than supplements, but that's what I do. So the final slide here, off the record, we do need an Australian consensus and research. Australia is different than America for a very good reason. I hope we remain a little bit different for a while. They're crazy over there and they'll do anything to anybody and sacrificing patients doesn't seem to bother them all that much. They do, however, progress the science, so there's an upside to the patient sacrifice. And this may all be irrelevant if the Medical Board of Australia regulations happen. The close of that is the April the 12th, uh, sorry, May the 12th now. They're inviting discussion. Just go to medicalboard.gov.au. It would mean no prescribing off-label for any medication for any doctor. It would mean no compounded pharmacy, no intravenous, no breaking of the skin for any purposes outside orthodoxy. So they have a concept of conventional medicine does fine, and if you vary, don't. Just go back to conventional medicine. And the argument is, if conventional medicine isn't helping, what do you do as the GP or the doctor with a person? You have to do this, and this would mean that every one of the doctors who I know would have their medical registration probably withdrawn fairly quickly for doing nothing more than saying, well, how about you try yoga, meditation, mindfulness, how about you change your diet? Why? Because most doctors don't do that. And to be judged by what most doctors do as if it's good medicine is to me absurd. So I am getting people to go there, give their opinion. The, the, the group of doctors they call out are complementary, unconventional. And being unconventional in a world like this is not a bad thing. So with that said, I'll leave my contact details up there. If any of you have a cure for chronic fatigue syndrome, I'd really love to hear it. I have to go back over all of the bloody talks you've given, Heidi. So I'm hoping they're online to look at later, are they? They will be. OK, so I will catch up on my research. And uh, I will obviously answer any of the concerns that you may have about what I just said then. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.